Hello, and welcome to this edition of District Dialogue. I'm District 3 Commissioner Tarania Carthen, and on this edition, we will talk about tax millage rates. We will educate the citizens about how to look at your tax bill, what your tax bill consists of, and even what's the market conditions here in Douglas County. So stay tuned. This is a live town hall, and we're here at the gorgeous Connect Douglas Transportation Center. So I hope you enjoyed this edition of District Dialogue. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this edition of District Dialogue and the Town Hall for District 3. This is a live taping, so you all will see yourselves next month in October when this airs on DCTV 23. So thank you all for showing up. Uh, this Town Hall conversation is really about educating the public, us as constituents, regarding our millage rate and how the millage rate how the assessment and appraisals of your personal property actually affects your taxes. I wanted to have this district dialogue in this town hall because there's a lot of misconception. Even before I became a commissioner or I sat on the board of assessors, I really didn't understand the makeup of the tax bill. I myself would get it, look at it and go, woo, okay, it's going up again. There were a few times when it did go down and of course, I was excited about that, as we all are. But being educated about what is your tax bill, the tax digest, the budget that makes up the county so that we can give services to everyone, I think is a crucial discussion that we needed to have. So today, we have with us people who can answer your questions and give you more information regarding your millage rate and your tax bill and the property appraisals here in Douglas County. So first off, we have our chief appraiser, Mr. Steve Balfour. Next to Mr. Balfour is a real estate professional here in Douglas County, Ms. Tisha Curry. We have our new CFO to Douglas County, Ms. Ramona Bivens. And of course, you all may know our tax, uh, our chief tax uh, commissioner. <laughs> Sorry, Greg. <laughs> our chief tax commissioner, Mr. Greg Baker. Um, all of these professionals here will be able to help break down what uh, your tax bill consists of. So without further ado, I will sit down and I will allow Mr. Balfour to start us off. Good afternoon. I'm Steve Balfour, Chief Appraiser, Douglas County, and my responsibility is to get the property values in Douglas County, all real, personal, exempt, utilities, motor vehicles valued at their appropriate value, which is considered fair market value. I am guided by the Department of Revenue. Department of Revenue sets guidelines to help us to make our assessments fair and equitable. So the primary um, indicator is sales. We look at market sales. So market forces drives what we do. We look at market sales in neighborhoods and then we um, we do a sales ratio study, and this sales ratio study is um, used to increase our values or lower our values. So Department of Revenue says our sales ratio need to be within 90% and 110% of sales. So that's how our sales ratio is done. And um, we use these numbers to get our um, valued properties in the county. And um, this year we did um, pretty decent. Um, our values were to get an accepted digest, we need to be within those guidelines. And our digest was accepted by the Department of Revenue. So um, with that said, this is how um, we get our budgets. The, these other folks are responsible. Um, we are all together responsible for getting um, 
we get the numbers, we value the properties, and um, the budget is done by these other people, the, the board of commissioners, the state, and the, the school, school board. So this is how we pay our people. We pay the fire department, the police. This is, this is what we do. So we all work together to, be, um, to make our county successful so we can celebrate our county. Thank you so much. So, Mr. Balfour, how many assessors actually go into the field to assess properties within Douglas County, and how often is that done? Okay, we have a staff complement of 19 persons, um, which includes admin personnel and um, receptionists, etc. But we currently have nine appraisers, nine appraisers of which five works the field. So we have five appraisers that um, regularly works in the field. One is what we call a data collector. So she um, goes into the field and um, updates data if there are changes, etc. But our uh, certified appraisers that works the field are four certified appraisers. And we need to be certified also by the Department of Revenue. So there are different appraisal level. We have an appraiser one, appraiser two, appraiser three, and appraiser four level. So, and this, this training are done by the Department of Revenue, and we need to have all certified appraisers to have uh, an accepted digest. If our appraisers are not certified, they will not, they will, the Department of Revenue will reject the digest. So, we have five that works the field. And when, have a seat. We're going to have a conversation. As the appraisers go out into the field, they're looking at the properties, but they are not only looking at the properties, they're trying to see if there are any changes, right? Architectural or structural changes to the properties. Even if they find some, do, does the property value go up? It may go down. Explain that. That's correct. We, our appraisers, um, they have an eye for changes. So um, we are required by the Department of Revenue to review each parcel at least once every three years. That we are obligated to do that. So we will go to, we try to visit all properties and um, look for changes. So we might have gone to an, a property last year and they did not have a swimming pool. Then they added a pool. What trigger our going into the field? It's um, building permits. We, um, we our, our planning and zoning department, um, they get the building permits and the permit department, and they send permits to us. So we will go out on a building permit. Another trigger is a sale. A property may have sold for 200,000 and our assessment is saying 50,000. So we, that's a discrepancy, so we need to go see that property. And the converse is also true. A property may have sold for 100,000 and we have 50,000 on our books or higher. So we, the sales trigger um, our uh, visits to properties. Thank you for that. Uh, next, we'll have Ms. Curry. Ms. Curry is a, a seasoned real estate agent here in Douglas County, and she was also a, a former Board of Assessors member, so she has a lot of, of knowledge. Um, but in your role today, we want you to talk a little bit about the market here in Douglas County. We know that uh, a lot of property values have increased, and I uh, don't know if that's still the case or if we're on a downside. But talk about that, and even how investors may uh, tilt the scales when it comes to property values here in the county? Good question, good <laughs> question. Uh, it's interesting, I was um, doing some research on, on um, the investor market a little bit earlier today before I got the call, so we'll talk about that in just a second. Uh -huh. um, what, I, what I will say is it's still a great time to be a home owner and a home seller Yes, we have seen uh, a, a slowdown. And actually, I've, I've got some information, some housing indicator information over the last three months where 
The median sales price in May was about $414,000 in Douglas County. June, it was 415000 but July we saw a dip down to three eighty five. dollars mm -hmm. um, I usually get the August numbers around the 15th of the month, so I haven't been able to see um, what the, the specific numbers are. I have an idea, but I don't want to say until mm -hmm. I can confirm <laughs> what I think I know. Um, we have seen, though, a significant increase in the number of properties going on the market. Um, in May, we had uh, 12, only 12 houses were on the market in Douglas County in the month of May. Wow. 12. Wow. In June, it was 15 total in the MLS. In July, though, we had an uptick to 46. So we are seeing a significant increase in the number of homes that are going on the market. That does not mean, though, there aren't a number of sales. That just means that there are not that many market sales. We have seen a whole lot of off-market sales in Torinia, and I will talk a little bit about what's happening with investors. Um, the average days on market, which was the number of days from a house goes on the market to when it's under contract, in May was 16 days. July, we saw 22 days. It'll be interesting to see what that August number to see how significant that is. Um, when we talk about investors coming into the market, um, they are, they're, I want to say ruthless, right? And I say that because I have a couple of rental properties. And so those investors notice that my mailing address is different from the property address. And I get no less than 10 calls every single day about, um, selling, selling those properties. I mean, it, it's just, sometimes I just, it, it's a lot. Um, so with that being said, um, I, I want you to be careful about that if you choose to sell your home to an investor who just, you know, just calls you just because it's easier and you don't really want to do any work to the property, right? So sometimes that's where we, ah, I don't want to go through the hassle of showings. Mm -hmm. I, I don't really want to do all that, right? Earlier this year in March, um, my clients um, had a property that they wanted to sell and they had one idea of what the property was worth. The investor had a different idea of what the property was worth. We got a difference of $100,000. Wow. That went into my client's pocket simply because they enlisted a professional who knows what's happening in the market. That property did also sell off market though, right? So there's still some things that are, that are some nuances that are, that are happening. I say all that to say, it, it doesn't take a lot for, I, I'm sure so many of you know a realtor, right? They, you know someone who sells real estate. If you don't, you're more than welcome to contact me. Before you sign those agreements, just say, you, you got a few minutes just to kind of chat with you just a little bit about what the value of my property is. A lot of times, you know, realtors are out of the market because people say, well, I can just do it myself. And you can. There's nothing wrong with that. There's also nothing wrong with you getting a second opinion. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason why I'm saying this to Absolutely. you is because we just saw in Phoenix what we call um, a, a a double barrel as far as the market is concerned and that is there was a decline in the sales market as well as a decline in the rental market meaning that there's more inventory staying on the market now what's concerning about that is because Phoenix is the number two rental market in the in the country for investors buying homes guess what market is number one Atlanta Atlanta, Atlanta. Georgia Right? So we need to pay attention to what's happening in other places because, you know, it, it's, it leaves clues. Okay? So, um, and things are happening fast. Uh, kind of like what happened in 2008. Um, I was in the market then. I liken it to um, if you've ever seen the movie Hancock. Anybody see that movie with Will Smith? Yeah. And you remember that locomotive was like going and all of a sudden he put his hand out and everything came to a halt, right? We, we need to be paying attention to that because that's essentially what happened in 2008, okay? So, I mean, we, we're in a very strong market as far as um, employment is concerned. 
Um, and we have a, a good diversity of industry, whereas in some places where there's only one or two industries, if one of them goes down, the whole place goes down. Uh, fortunately for us, um, we, we do have a variety, so, so we'll be okay. What I would say to you is be vigilant because um, I just want you to be as informed about what's happening in the market as you possibly can be. Thank you for that. All right. And, and be, be, before you, you can hold it. Okay. Before, um, before you pass the mic, uh, investors versus real estate um, owners who sell their properties. They, we, we know that there is sometimes a big difference. Like you said, people only, you know, they don't want to fix up the property. And so if somebody comes and offers to buy their property for more than they thought they would get, then that's appealing. And so they will take the money, especially if they're downsizing. Like I'm an empty nester, right? So my babies are, you know, practically gone, right? For, for me to keep maintaining this house, it takes a lot, even though it's just me there. If somebody came for the right price, and I get them all the time too, I may want to sell, right? So, but my neighbor who hasn't, you know, who, who's going to stick it out because they have kids, my selling for $200,000 more than my property is probably worth, how would that affect the rest of the real estate around me? So let's talk about worth. Okay. Okay. A property is worth what a ready, willing, and able buyer will pay for it. Doesn't matter what the market says, doesn't matter what you as the homeowner says, it, 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 it's an agreement, right? So for you, a house may not be worth $200,000 more mm -hmm. than your neighbor. Perhaps if someone's using that property for a different reason, like rental income, and they don't have a mortgage because they're paying cash, and the rent is their return on their investment, Perhaps it is worth it to them. So we'll talk about, that's what I mean when I say about worth. As a seller, uh, you have some things that you need to consider, right? When you have these investors coming in with cash saying, we are going to waive our inspection and we're not going to ask you to repair anything and we're going to pay you $25,000 over what the market will pay you and we can close in 14 days and you can stay in the house for an extra 30 days after that. Wow. When an FHA buyer comes in and says, but I need you to help me with closing costs, that's a hard sell from a real estate agent's perspective working mm -hmm. on behalf of the seller. Most of our sellers who live in individual homes don't look at this from a larger market perspective. Yeah. But it impacts all of us. Yet it has a huge impact, impact on yeah. what happens with all of us because for many of us who bought our homes, we like the thought that our neighbor owns their home and they're going to keep up their lawn and they're right. going to make sure it's painted, right. right? When you don't know that the investor next door has bought the house next door and the one across the street and the one three doors down, what does that look like for, for your investment? Mm -hmm. And that, you know, unfortunately, um, construction has not been keeping up with uh, the growth in Metro Atlanta as far as people coming here. And so, you know, there are people who are renters that may be somewhat transient that want to live in a house, but they don't necessarily want to be tied to it. Mm -hmm. we're, we're living in a more remote society. So I just feel like it's something we're going to live with for a, a good period of time, especially because in Metro Atlanta, many of us are knowledge workers, which means that we can work anywhere there's internet and a computer. True. Thank you so much for that. You're welcome. Ms. Bivens, we will pass the mic to you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. So this evening, I'm going to talk about that dreaded word, the millage rate. <laughs> but it's really not that bad. It's just I think people don't understand the millage rate and how we come up with the millage rate and some of the terminology that we use when we're adopting the millage rate um, with the Board of Commissioners. So. Um, when you get your tax bill, it's, a, it's three steps to that bill getting to you. The so you first may, step. You may have this handout. Yes, I'm not, on, I'm not in there yet, but okay. we're going to get there in a minute. Yeah. The first step starts over here with Mr. Balfour, as he stated, the tax assessor, where they assess all your property values. You get a little notice in the mail in the spring. Is it March or April? Somewhere in that time frame. 
that tells you what your assessed values are. You have an opportunity to appeal. And once he does all that, that is what gives us what is called the property tax digest. And we calculate the millage rate. Um, we use the millage rate to calculate the property taxes, which, are, which is used to support the budget that the board approves. And in that budget are all the expenses, um, the expenditures that are required for the day-to-day -day operation of the county, um, paying public safety, law enforcement, all of those good things that everybody wants, parks and recreation, the courts, senior, the courts the, your tax dollars fund all of that. So I have a semi-short presentation that mm -hmm. I prepared, and you all should have a copy. I sent copies over. So um, what is property tax? So a property tax is a tax that's charged by the local government on your property to support government services, as I stated earlier, all those things, um, salaries and benefits, um, keep the lights on, roads, all of those things. The um, property, we have two types of property. You have real property, which is um, anything that's, that's land, plus any of the buildings or fixtures that are permanently affixed or attached to, the, to that land. And we have personal property. These are items that are not perma permanently affixed to land, such as your vehicle, equipment, things of that nature. So on the next page, um, how do property taxes work? So there are local and state laws that govern the process, as um, tax assessor alluded to earlier, and there are two components to calculating that tax. The property values, which we derive from the digest, and then the tax rate, which is also called the millage rate, that is set by the Board of Commissioners. The property values, we've already determined there is an annual appraisal by the tax assessor's office that determines the value. Values increase or decrease based on inflation's impact on property values, and there's also an increase due to growth um, due to development. Um, I think he spoke of when people um, do improvements on their homes. That would be considered um, growth because right. that's a, mm -hmm. because it's more development. And also, I just wanted to make sure everybody knows this: the Board of Commissioners does not have any role in determining the property values. Um, I've been doing this for a while um, um, in another county, and then I work for a school district, so I've been working with millage rates, oh goodness, since 2005. Y'all do the math. <laughs> a long time. So um, it's always so, um, I would get phone calls when I was with the school system, and even with the county, that my previous county, and they said, well, I got my bill today, and the value is, I'm like, I'm sorry, I understand, I can't help you, you're going to have to call the tax assessor. So I just want, it's important as part of the education process that everyone knows that the governing entity, the school board, the county, the city, they do not have any role in determining the property values. So the millage rate, that is the tax rate that is applied to your property value to determine how much property taxes you will pay each year. So it is um, established by the governing entity each year and it's stated as dollars per thousand. So for example, one mill is equal to one dollar per thousand of assessed value. And when you're calculating it, um, it's two ways to do it. I do it the hard way because I don't feel like moving that decimal point. Remember we in school, we were in school and we had to learn how to move the decimal point. So um, say for instance, I'm, in my example, I'm gonna use 15 mills. So you would need to move that decimal point to the left three times to get 0 0.015. So in my example on your, on your PowerPoint, though, I have one mil. So you would take that 0 .001 and multiply it times the um, value of your home to determine how much you would pay in taxes. So the next slide, next slide, it's not showing up here, but on page six of your um, handout shows how to calculate the property tax. So your property tax is equal to the assessed property value times the millage rate. So I have an example here. Um, we're going to assume that the assessed property value um, last year, because this is going to be important when we get further on and start talking about the rollback rate, which is even more confusing. Um, that we're going to use a $10 million as our assessed property value. However, you don't pay taxes on that $10 million. You only pay it on 40% of the assessed value. So um, in our millage rate, we're going to assume it's 15 mills. So to calculate your property taxes, you take the 10 million assessed value times 40% to get um, what we call the taxable 
value. And I have assessed value, I should have put taxable value, but that's what you're gonna pay taxes on is that $4 million. You multiply it times the millage rate of 15, either 0 0.015 or the 4 million times 15 divided by 1,000, and your tax bill will be $60,000. Now nobody, that, well it's not your tax bill, that's the amount of revenue that's generated from that digest. So that digest of $10 million would generate $60,000 in tax revenue at 15 mils. Remember that. Because on the next slide, I'm gonna show the same calculation, but we're gonna assume the next year that we have a higher assessment of property, so the property value is increased by $5 million to $15 million. You following me? All right, so 40% of that is $6 million. So the taxes will be calculated on that $6 million. At the same millage rate, using the same millage rate, on a higher value, the taxes generated would be $90,000. That's a $30,000 difference. The state, according to the state, that is considered a tax increase. Even though we didn't change the millage rate, because the values increase, that increase the um, revenue. So your base, if your base increases and your multiplier, which is the, the tax rate, remains the same, your um, dollar amount that's generated will increase. So this is where um, the Georgia Taxpayers' Bill of Rights, which was signed into law in 1999, comes into play here. That law states that when increases in existing property values would increase property tax revenue, the government is required to calculate what is called a rollback rate. That is the millage rate that would keep the property tax revenue at the same amount as in the prior year to offset any inflationary increases in the digest. So in other words, that $10 million um, last year generated $60,000. We need to calculate <coughs> excuse me, a millage rate on the $15 million that would generate the same $60,000 <coughs> Excuse me. So it won't be considered a tax increase. Um, also, another way, just to state it on page nine, it says when the total digest of tax of a property is prepared by the tax assessor, state law requires calculating a rollback millage rate that will produce the same total revenue on the current year's digest that last year's millage rate would have produced had no reassessments occurred. So how is the rollback rate calculated? So you begin with the tax digest, which is the total amount of taxable properties in the county. If it goes up, it goes up or down based on inflation's impact on property values and growth in the digest due to development. If the property values increase, the value of the digest goes up. And um, we have experienced that not just here in Douglas County, but in counties across Metro Atlanta. Property values have gone through the roof. So that's why a lot of entity, a lot of governing entities have had what's considered a tax increase because we didn't change the millage rate, but because the base changed or increased, that increased the revenue that was generated. If new taxable properties are built, the value of the digest also increases. That's the development that you see going on. New houses are built, that increases the value of the digest as well. On page 11, I wanted to show a property tax calculation example using um, showing the $10 million. Remember earlier I said remember that $10 million? So we're gonna use that as our year one, or say last year. So again, at $10 million of digest value at a millage rate of 15, the 40% um, taxable value is four million. You see we have the tax revenue of $60,000. Year two, say this year for instance, we had an increase of $5 million, so our digest value is $15 million. We maintain the same millage rate. The 40% taxable value is $6 million. We get the $90,000 for this year, so it's $30,000. Again, it's a $30,000 increase in revenue. Again, it's considered a property tax increase. But this is where we have to look at what is the rollback rate, how do you calculate the rollback rate? So you take the new digest values, which in our example was $15 million, times the 40%, times X, which is the X is the new um, rollback rate. We don't know what that is, so we have to solve for X and divide it by 1,000. 
and we do know that $60,000 is what we are trying to get to. We want to make sure that our tax revenue remains at $60,000. So to solve for x, um, you do your um, algebra. X will equal, t will equal 10. So we would need to roll the millage rate back from 15 mils to 10 mils to generate that same $60 million. Does that make sense? Okay. And then on the last slide, 13, is just a comparison, tax revenue comparison, the rollback versus the prior year millage rate. Um, you can see on the first column is the rollback rate using the same $15 million in digest value. We do the 40% to get the taxable value times the 10 mils, you get $60,000. However, if we maintain at 15 mils, it's $90,000, so the difference is $30,000. Again, that's considered a tax increase. But in order to, um, well, I want to also say when we do that, if we maintain the millage rate and have a tax increase, we are required to advertise, advertise it as a tax increase and have public hearings for the public to come and speak on it. So um, I just want to, I, I hope that kind of cleared up. I know a lot of people, it's a lot for people to understand. I know when I first started doing it back in 2005, I'm like, okay, what in the world? But I've been doing it so long now. And thank my husband because I actually had done a presentation. He said, I still don't understand this. You need to dumb it down. I said, but I can't do it anymore. So I, I sat down this morning, I got up early. And I said, okay, let's see what else I can do. And then I came up with this. And he, saw, he said, that's much better. <laughs> so I hope I was able to put this in layman's terms where everybody could understand it. At least, if not completely, at least I'd have a better understanding of how the millage rate is calculated. And when the board approves it, it is applied to the total value to generate the revenue required to offset some of the expenses for the county. Now, once that is done, the next step goes over to the tax commissioner where he takes the digest. Do you take the digest to the state? Okay, because I know some people do it differently. He takes the digest to the state, gets it certified so he can send you the bill. And I'm gonna let him talk about the bill, what all is on the bill and how to read it and all that good stuff, because that's his area. I know what's on it, but I don't want to steal his thunder. Thank you. So, <laughs> thank you. But before, before you pass the mic, I do have one question for you. You stated that the, what it takes to run the county, if we do a rollback, um, that would give you the amount that you collected the prior year. That's if the values increased. Yes. Okay, talk, talk a little bit more about that. So if the values increase, well, let's talk about the budget. So we know, we try, when we start doing the budget process, we, I typically start with the baseline budget. Mm -hmm. That means everything remains the same. There's no salary increases in it, no anything. No inflation. No inflation, nothing. But we all know there's inflation every year. We want to pay the employees. The board has um, some strategic initiatives. The citizens have some things that they want, some priorities that they want the board to do. Um, and I understand that public safety is a priority, not just for the board, but for the community yeah. as a whole. Yeah. So in order to take care of those increases, we would have to have additional revenue to do that. Yeah. Most governments, their primary source of revenue is property taxes. I, as evil as people say it is, it's a fact. We have property taxes and we have local option sales tax, so just that 1%, that one penny that you pay, not just you, but other people pay as well when they come to shop in Douglas mm -hmm. County. So you don't bear the full burden of that particular tax. We spread the wealth with that one. Um, so when the, re when the expenditures increase, we have to have additional revenue to take care of that. So it's not always, um, we're not always able, or governments are not always able to go to that rollback rate because they need that additional revenue to cover those expenses to address some of the priorities that the community has, that the board has. So when we're looking at setting the millage rate, we certainly look at the rollback rate. Um, in my prior position, I have um, not gone with the rollback rate, but I also didn't maintain the millage rate. We gave some relief, we couldn't go all the way back, but we went back as far as we could to maintain and to add some of those additional things on there. So it just depends on what the priorities of the board, the community, what they are at the time, on how we set the millage rate, whether we roll it back or 
maintain. Also, another thing that you didn't think, that you didn't mention, I didn't mention either, years ago, you know, property values were going down. They were going way down. I didn't want to talk about that. Yeah, cause, but cause I that's just how I think we it's got to having to raise to the raise it, right? And uh, what some counties did, my former county, what they did is this ro the same rollback rate to generate the same amount of revenue, so you can at least maintain what you have. If you don't roll it back, even if it's a higher millage rate, you have to reduce your expenditures because you're not going to generate the same amount of revenue. That particular county that year lost $13 million in revenue because they didn't go with the rollback rate. And so they had cuts, I mean deep cuts, deep cuts. Deep cuts. And when I started there, I inherited that and had to make a lot of changes. Fortunately, we were blessed to have property values come back up, so we caught back up and I was able to actually reduce the millage rate by one meal one year. So that's, that's kind of how that process works. Thank you so much. Did I answer your question? You did. Awesome. You did. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. How's everyone? Good. My name is Greg Baker, and I'm the tax commissioner. Everybody hates to see me coming. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, <laughs> the title for the tax commissioner from the Constitution, it reads, they hate to see you coming like death and taxes. Yes. <laughs> I always get laugh when I see that because it's like, like where'd they get deaf and taxes? And it's true. Even I don't like to pay my taxes. I'm, I get my tax bill and I do the same thing you do. I go, what the heck is this? <laughs> but we got to pay them. Yeah. So my role in this is that uh, I work very well and closely with the tax assessors. They basically assess the property they go through and they give us all the data for all the properties in the county. Then what they do is they download that file into my computer. And then I take that computer and we calculate all that information from all the entities, the school board, the cities, uh, everybody that has something to do with taxes. And we take that information and we just crunch data. We just take numbers and we, we put it all together to come up with our tax bill. So we get that information from the city, we get it from the school board, and we have to wait till they do their millage rate too. If you notice on your tax bill, they have a millage rate on there. Everybody blames the board of commissioners, but if you look at the school board and the cities, if you live in the city, they all have a millage rate. And you gotta pay close attention because you're paying that too. Now, each entity is doing much better than they used to uh, because they manage their budgets very well now and they manage their millage rates very well. Now, that's where we get unhappy because we're paying those taxes for those millage rates, but each entity is, like a finance director said, they're looking at their expenditures and that's how they're coming up with that millage rate. Doesn't make us all happy because all we see is our taxes going up. And a lot of times we wonder, where did our taxes go? Uh, but that's how I get my information. I get my information from the assessor, and it's all generated by the state. The state is the one that generates all of this. And then I put together the tax bill. I submit it. First of all, I submit it to the state. The state has to approve or disapprove it. Mm -hmm. If they disapprove it, then we have we to go back <laughs> and recreate more numbers, redo the numbers <laughs> until we can come up with a ratio that the uh, state will approve. Uh, luckily, we haven't had to do that, but we've been very well with the state, and we've had our digest approved every year. Um, and then I, what I do is I put together all that information, and then I submit it to my printing company, and they print your tax bills. That was submitted today, by the way, in case you were wondering. <laughs> so you should be getting them very quickly. And then your tax bills go out, which they should be out probably next week or the week after. And they'll be due in November. And that's basically how we get your tax bill. We put together all that information from all entities. And, and trust me, it's a chore to get that data from some of these entities. Because we have to go through every, every number we almost go through from all of those entities and make sure they're right. And then we put that together and that's how your tax bills come out. Now, we do a very good job of collecting taxes right now. 
Right now, we've always been at 98% collection rate. Uh, by the end of the year, we're usually at 99% collection, which is very good. Some counties aren't like that. So we're, we're collecting your taxes, and we're trying to hit everybody. We, we leave no stone unturned. Um, we collect all the delinquent taxes that we can, and we try to get them before they get out of the county. As you know, some, some almost sneak out of the county, but we're good at chasing them down. I got a, uh, Mr. Barnhill. I don't know if a lot of you know him. He's very good at uh, finding these folks and going and collecting our taxes because we'll chase them down and get them very well. So we got a 99% collection rate, and the county's in good shape. Uh, that's all I can tell you. The, the money's coming in. I'll, I'll just say it like that. So we, we have a good collection rate. We have a good revenue stream coming in. Um, I'm just like you. I would love for my taxes to be lower, but I also understand the expenses that the county has and the uh, things that we do. We may not always like how they spend in it, but, but I don't sit in their seat either, and I don't want to sit in their seat because uh, it's a lot of heat that comes. But I get a lot of heat too because everybody thinks the tax commissioner raised taxes. Thank you. So, Commissioner Baker, uh, in collecting, if, if you don't collect, how does that impact the county as a whole? It's like running a business. You got to collect revenue to pay, pay your bills. So basically, I have to make sure I do the best job that I can to collect all the revenues that I can so that they can pay the bills, pay employees, get your roads paved, uh, and improve parks and recreations, and just the stuff to run the county and the cities to run their cities and the school board to run the school board. So that's the way I look at it is I got to go out there and do the best job that we can at my office to collect those taxes. Now, I don't have anything to do with the value of raising taxes. I just have to collect the taxes. And, that, and I'm, on the, I'm on the tail end, so that's why everybody thinks that I raise taxes and they hate to see me coming. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, I had a couple of questions that were uh, emailed to Tabria and I. And so I'll start by answering some of those. Uh, if you have questions, just raise your hand if I don't address something that you may um, yourself want to know. But the first question um, I will start with is uh, from Sharon Bachtel. It says, when will you start cutting the budget so our taxes will go down instead of increasing every year because you do not roll the millage rate back? So the answer to that question is, even though we have not increased the millage rate for the last two years, our budget requests have continually increased. Um, if we, we actually do cut the budget. And we cut it by a lot. We have about 27 departments that all need. We can't possibly fund them all. Um, one of our biggest departments is, of course, one that we all need. And if we don't fund it, it will cause a decline in our county. And that's our public safety. And that is from the sheriff to the fire EMS to uh, the coroner's office to our courts and our DA. Those offices are vital to Douglas County. And so even though we can't match what Atlanta or Cobb pays, we've done a lot to get pretty close. And there is a continual ask and a continual need. So when someone says, why don't you cut? Trust me, a lot of things have been cut. Uh, Douglas County for a long time didn't even really make the minimum wage cut. Uh, we had employees who were working here making 7 and $8 an hour, yet everything around us has gone up. And COLA was not hitting them so that they could take care of their families. So one of the things that I did coming in was ask, how can we make sure that everybody that I look at at least can go to the grocery store, at least can put foot on the table, at least can um, have a better quality of life for the ones that they come to work for at Douglas County and go back home to. 
So we raised the minimum wage to $15 an hour. That's still only $30,000, around $32,000 a year. That's still pretty low. That's still under the median income uh, for someone who is providing services. And these people are more than likely your neighbors. You see them every day. You see them when you take your kids or your grandkids out. Um, so I, I would hope that we would all want to make sure that the people we come in contact with on a daily basis are at least making the minimum um, quality of life decisions that will help them to raise their families. So trust and believe. We do a lot of cutting. Uh, Ms. Vivis and I was talking about how much we have to cut because everybody has a request. And one of the biggest expenditures is employee salaries. On top of that, when people ask for uh, more, whether it is in employee salaries to bring them up to par, um, there are retirement benefits that go with that. And one of the biggest uh, bills Douglas County has is the tax retirement bill that we have to pay on a yearly basis. And we must do that. It's mandated by the state. Um, so there is a lot of cutting that goes on. As a matter of fact, we will have a um, retreat coming up in about two weeks with elected officials who come before us and ask us, you know, can this be included in their budget? And oftentimes, everyone that comes before us never goes down on what they asked for the previous year. They always go up because there's always a need. And Douglas County has grown. As you see, we're sitting inside the transportation center. Uh, not the ideal place to have a town hall, but it's the best facility we could get right now, right? Um, so there is a lot of need in Douglas County and the Board of Commissioners tries to spread what we collect um, fairly among the departments and the requests that we have. So that, that answers that question, hopefully. Um, I had a next question from uh, Sharon Bachtel. Why did you vote to increase taxes while promoting wasteful spending, such as $20,000 for Facebook upkeep and a $175,000 contract to collaborative firm for SPLOS Education? Why did you vote to spend $500,000 from general funds on a new park if we need that money for the future salaries of public safety? Public safety is more important than new parks. Thank you. Thank you for your question. So while I did not vote to increase taxes, uh, the millage rate has not been increased since 2020. So uh, if your property value did not increase, if the assessors came to your property and your value stayed the same, then your tax bill stayed the same if you live in unincorporated Douglas County. Now, if you live in incorporated Douglas County and you're not a senior and you're still paying school board taxes, then yeah, your, your, your tax bill probably went up. But if you are a senior and you're exempt from school board taxes, you don't live in the city and you live in the county and your property value didn't increase, well, guess what? Neither did your bill. So it stayed the same. So that's not a tax increase. Uh, so I did not vote for a tax increase. None of the Board of Commissioners voted for a tax increase. We did not roll back the millage rate just so that we could keep up with inflation and the cost of living adjustment. So I hope that answers that part of your question. Uh, when it comes to $20,000 for Facebook upkeep, I did not vote to spend $20,000 on Facebook upkeep. Um, so I can't answer you there. Uh, $175,000 contract to collaborative firm for SPLOS education. So we do have a SPLOS that will be on the referendum this November. I can't tell you to vote for it, but what I will say is take a look around the county and a lot of signs you will see that says this is, uh, this is here due to your SPLOS pennies. Uh, SPLOS is a, a special purpose local, local option sales tax that when we go to stores and spend, one penny comes back to the county to fund projects that we can't fund out of the general fund. Because remember, I told you, we, we do cut a lot. And the only way we get tax, um, revenue is through loss and through property tax. That's it. Right. So those, those fees are the only ways that we can um, actually fund the budget to give you services. So how do we get a new park? Or how do we get a tax commissioner's building, which is absolutely beautiful? <laughs> 
Those things come through SPLOS. How do we get that jail? That jail came through SPLOS. How do we get boundary waters? It came through SPLOS. And everybody, not just the citizens who live in Douglas County, but those who come to visit us, those who travel into Douglas County, actually get to help us fund some of those projects. So uh, the collaborative firm was selected to be the SPLOS educator for that because the Board of Commissioners, we can't advocate for that. Even though we, we may think it does great, it's really up to you all, the voters, to decide whether or not that's worthwhile. And so since we're removed from it, we have to have someone go out and educate the public to do that. And so the collaborative firm did it um, five years ago, almost six years ago, and they were successful in getting people to come and, uh, and say yes to that. Prior to that, um, a splice was on the ballot and it got voted down. And the Board of Commissioners uh, decided, okay, we need to educate the public on how this really works. And so that $175,000 went to a firm to do what they had done prior to, uh, prior to the previous splice that we had. Why did you vote to spend $500,000 from general fund on a new park if we need money for future salaries of public safety? So the new park was uh, a, a project from our predecessor, great project, might I add, uh, but I carried out what was already there. Um, that was not a SPLOS per se project. Uh, it was not included in uh, the 2000 and, um, 14 or 16 SPLOS. So the $500,000 that came out of general fund was actually funds set aside coming in for, um, for capital improvements. So we took it from that to complete that park. Um, I don't believe it was a total of $500,000, but it, it, it could have been around that um, area, but some of those were also grants. So it wasn't just everything taken uh, from the taxpayers to do that. Um, I am one who believes that quality of life is significant in Douglas County. Um, we have a, a Taj Mahal jail, yes, but I will preferably never see the inside of that jail and possibly you all don't want to see the inside of that jail either, right? So I, although I won't experience the jail, I will experience a park. I will experience those things that I could take my children and hopefully my grandchildren to one day. And so I do want those types of entities where I can actually experience my tax dollar. Um, so I hope that answers your question for that. And public safety is definitely important because if we don't have good public safety, we won't have commercial businesses that want to relocate here. And as you see, there are businesses steady coming to Douglas County. Industry is steadily coming to Douglas County. It helps that we are in great proximity to the airport. It helps that we're in great proximity to Atlanta. So it helps our economic development. But without safety, they wouldn't want to relocate here because they wouldn't want to bring their employees and their family members here. So safety is a number one priority and we must fund that. So uh, that is why um, I and the Board of Commissioners voted to give um, a 15% increase um, to the salaries of our safety department. 10% uh, the first year, 5% the next year. Uh, and those were done using ARPA funds. So that did not come out of the general fund, which is why one of the reasons we were recommended not to roll it back, because that money needs to be there, because ARPA won't, right? We thank Biden for the ARPA money, but that money won't be there. And so in order for us to continue those um, salary um, increases that we gave, we have to have the money in the general fund. So I hope that answers that question. But it seems to me like the county board does not communicate to the county Public. about the cuts that they make, things that they have to do. Well, how do we know that? All we see is this goes up, this goes up, you hire this person, you hire this person, and all the expenses keep going up. Yes, we all know inflation exists, but you guys need to communicate more. And I'm not just pointing my hand at you. The whole board needs to communicate to the electorate. I agree, and that is why I'm doing this, right? Edu educate, educate, educate. As a commissioner, I legislate, meaning I put forth resolutions and ordinances 
that will help the county to be safe and, and otherwise uh, I appropriate, which is the budget, which is why we're here, and then I can educate. And so this is one of the reasons why I'm doing this. Uh, at our last hearing, um, it was regarding the millage rate, and I had a lot of people coming up saying things that were sort of not in line with what we know was true. At that time, I can't stop the meeting and go, well, no, that's not true, right? But if they're feeling that way, then possibly other people are feeling the same way. So why not take the time to educate? This is being recorded. It's going to be put on DCTV 23. People can watch this over and over again, and hopefully you guys will spread the word about what you learned here today. That's, that was my goal, but you are absolutely right. We need to do more educating about what we are doing as a commission, what we do cut. What I will say is as we get ready to have these budget hearings, it, they are public. By law, we must make these meetings public. You are more than welcome to sit in on any of those meetings. So and they you, will be virtual, they'll be live there. They will, they will be live. Our next one, I believe, is at the Lithia Springs Senior Center. Senior Center. So yes, they are published in the Douglas County Sentinel. They are put on CelebrateDouglasCounty.com. And so you will actually be able to see when they are, where they are, and you are more than welcome to come. And you get all the information that we get at the same time. So I, I hope that this conversation has helped to clear up some things that were probably mud. Uh, and if you have more questions, Email me, email Tabria. We, we will definitely get you an answer, right? I don't know all the answers, but we have a lot of department heads and directors that we lean on to get those answers for you. Uh, I will say that in terms of planning out this county, we are doing um, a UDC, uh, and we are asking the public to come out to these meetings. Um, that gives us your take of what you want to see in your neighborhoods as we start to plan and zone these areas. If you don't want a warehouse next to your subdivision, come to these meetings, please, right? When you see them published in the Douglas County Sentinel and on Celebrate Douglas uh, County, come and let us know your thoughts. All of these um, suggestions, ideas, questions, they go into the plan. The plan is then formulated and it is brought before the Board of Commissioners um, and your areas, your character areas are zoned out. Uh, I know that there is a Waffle House and a, <laughs> and a Dollar General that is coming on Chapel Hill and I got so many emails and calls about that. Trust me, I cannot discriminate, but I could not stop that development either because it was already zoned for that retail. So there was nothing that we could do other than tell them, make it look nice and make sure that the trash is contained. We are going to ensure that and safety because there needs to be safety because it's across the street from a middle school. But that area was already zoned before I became your commissioner. It is imperative that for the next 10 years, this is what the study will do, that you come out and give us your input. So I hope to see you at a next county commissioner's meeting at a next planning and zoning meeting, and a next UDC meeting, come out, give us your feedback. And I thank you for being a part of this district dialogue. Thank you. <laughs>